a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul. Whatever thou be, until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello. Hello, sir. Back to a normal episode today. No more drinks clanking. Dang it. Not lots of announcements. Dang it. (laughs) Lots of scares. Okay. Uh, Real quick, before we get to those scares, uh, po, po. Oh. Why are you doing that? Eight foot tall woman, tie dyed sweatpants. Sweatpants oh, now sweat in the sweatpants. <laughs> now in the store extra now. Fancy. <laughs> uh, they're in the store now at uh, badmagicmerch.com. Very cool. S- still one of my favorite stories. Uh, and a fan favorite for sure. God, I love that story. So many emails about that, and so many like, please go back to more Japanese folklore. Yeah, it's been tough to. F- well, you know, actually, we are heading to Japan today. Okay, we well. are heading to some uh, Japanese folklore today a little bit. Cool. Uh, reminder that uh, on high noon Pacific time, Monday, August sixteenth. Bad Magic Production Street Team stickers will go live on badmagicmerch.com. This is so fun. These stickers are free, but there will only be 500 sticker sticker packs available. So first come, first serve. Slap them all over, take a pic, post it on Instagram or Facebook with the hashtag Bad Magic Street Team for the chance to win two hundred dollars, and uh, so we can find them and repost them. Well, not to win two hundred dollars, to win two hundred dollars of I'm free sorry, merch. I'm sorry, two hundred dollars worth of free merch. Yeah, yes. I, I should have finished that. Yeah, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just send you a check. It's fine. <laughs> uh, spread your favorite STD and maybe win some merch. Do it, do it. So can't wait to see where all those stickers end up. It's so fun. And then lastly, uh, recording early again due to summer vacation. Quick reminder that we gave at least $14,000 this month, thanks in large part to the Patreon subscriptions of our Roberts and Annabelles, to the August Bad Magic Productions charity, the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. Since 1999, the foundation has provided emergency support services to the families of firefighters, seriously injured or killed in the line of duty and more families left behind many with young children often find themselves with few resources and this foundation steps in to help so you can go to wffoundation.org to learn more and that's it that's great yeah and just one thing on the charity it's cool because uh it's so broad reaching that you can go on their website and find like a local you might be able to find like a local fundraiser for it so if it's something that speaks to you but you don't have maybe the funds to help participate uh support that you can you know volunteer volunteer your time yeah yeah i don't know what they're doing in the COVID era but i saw like lots of like poker runs and something at a bar and it was very cool. I bet they're doing a lot right now just with all the fires. It's so I know, crazy. But there's, there's still restrictions in places. Yeah. So, you know. Now let's talk about some stories. Let's many, do it. How many stories today? I have two. And I'm just going to say, Dan, huh? uh-huh. my first story, I mean, I'll remind you when I start it. Yeah. But like, we're going to talk about crystals. You want me to be nice? I want you to have a good attitude. Okay. okay. I'll do my best. We talked about this off air before as well. I was like, Dan. Okay. Be kind. I'll try not to shit on the crystal parade. No, you're gonna you're going to I think you're actually going to love the story. Okay. Because it's how crystals maybe are not so great. Oh. Uh, uh-huh. All right. Okay. All okay. Right. Interested. And, and then my second story, a wild story of a haunted house, Ouija board situation. And at the top of that story, I'll give a a violence warning. I don't want to call it a trigger warning, but like if you have little kids listening, you might wanna screen this one first. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I am interested in both of those tales. But I, I'm very excited about my two stories today uh, also. But uh, Both revolve around supposedly haunted hotels. I've been wanting some haunted hotel stories. Great. We're uh, about to go on vacation, so that sounds horrible. And two very different kind of stories. In the first, a creepy bit of urban legend from Japan uh, clashes with real life, uh, clashes with the real life deaths of two young women. Does mm. vengeful spirit haunt the area around the Subono Spa Hotel in Uzu City? And did it take the lives of two women the night they were trying to prove how paranormally brave they were? Oh, boy. In the second story, we head to Miami and explore the fabulous and supposedly fantastically haunted Biltmore Hotel. Oh, yeah. This is a f- uh, an amazing hotel, by the way. A young couple on their honeymoon check-in, uh, hoping to enjoy a bit of luxury for several days and nights, and they end up fleeing the grounds without making it through even the first night. Yeah. Biltmore, that's a um, a pretty famous, I think, brand of hotels. Or maybe it's just a coincidence. I don't know. But I yeah. believe that there's a very 
fancy Biltmore in New York. I'll have pictures, of course, uh, of that one at the end, and it is opulent. And it's still still open. Okay, mm-hmm. it's been open, closed, open, closed. Currently open. Currently open. Coral but Gables I mean, it, I just outside it still Miami. exists. I didn't oh, know. Oh yeah. Like okay, mm-hmm. okay. Still yeah, still exists. Still um, I think pretty popular. Okay. Plenty of time to settle in for this first tale. I love heading to Japan for ghost stories. Oh, you got your uh, unicorn socks. Very cute. And no dress, so I can like really show them off this week. <laughs> no. I like the colors on those. I, well, look at it. It's all I'm thematic here. Nice. Um, Japan is a country that seems to love paranormal lore as much as I do. Japan's a nation where ghosts and the supernatural have a special position in daily life and cultural celebrations where traditionalists who hold on to the old ways still believe that many of our spirits linger on after death. A nation where skeptics have a real hard time remaining skeptical when they often encounter these spirits. Sometimes in Japan, like anywhere else, these spirits can be good entities, providing the opportunity for closure and a continued sense of connection with one's loved ones, providing hope for the continuing of your consciousness after death. Other times, of course, the spirits can be very, very bad, perhaps bad and violent enough to kill. Some have wondered if two young women who went to investigate a haunting and disappeared may have come across some of these violent spirits. In Japan, the hot summer months are celebrated as a season of hauntings, with the belief that the scariest of ghost stories might give you enough chills to cool you down. It's a season for ghost stories, scary movies, thrilling books, uh, with magazines and TV stations running special features on uncanny events and weird and disturbing phenomena. It's similar to the time around Halloween in the West, a time to get well and truly frightened. The association of summer with spine-chilling tales has its roots in Buddhist tradition. The Japanese Buddhist festival of the dead, called Obon, takes place during the summer, and during this season, it is believed that the boundaries between the physical and spiritual worlds grow particularly thin, allowing the spirits of the dead to revisit their families. For the spiritually curious and paranormally adventurous, it's an opportunity to go ghost hunting, practicing a tradition known as Kimodameshi, which translates in English literally to liver strength, but means a test of courage. Oh, I thought it was like a drinking game. No, a test of courage, but that would make sense. Uh, These tests usually involve the exploration of supposedly haunted locations, such as abandoned buildings or graveyards, during the dead of night to prove to oneself and others that you are brave enough to challenge any fear of the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Many young Japanese people have enjoyed this tradition for years, reveling in the closeness they feel with their peers after a few spooks. However, in May of 1996, uh, the kimodameshi of two schoolgirls would end in much more than spooks. On May 5th, 1996, the last day of the Golden Week holiday season, a series of four national holidays all wrapped up into one week, uh, that is the traditional time for Japanese families to take vacations, two schoolgirls from Himi City in the Toyama Prefecture decided to take part in the kimodameshi and test their courage. Megumi Yashiki and Narumi Takumi, both 19 years old at the time, planned to travel to a notoriously haunted location in Uzu City, roughly 35 miles east of Himi City. Why this location? A few days before their trip, Megumi and Narumi spoke to some friends at a local park, two guys who claimed to have recently traveled to the same spot to partake in a kimodameshi. The spot was the uh, Subono Spa Hotel. Time now for the tale of Don't Stop. Located in the mountainous area of Uzu, the sixth floor structure was once a place where you could go to escape the busy city life, enjoy its hot springs, and relax while overlooking the scenic horizon of the Toyama Prefecture. In 1982, the business went bankrupt and was left abandoned after the owner failed to find a suitable buyer. Ownership of the property fell to the city, and the cost of tearing down the building at the time was over 25 million yen. The city didn't have that much money to spend on a teardown, so the building was boarded up and cordoned off. This led to it becoming a hot spot for teens and vandals who used the hotel as a place to wreak some havoc, trash the building, smash some windows, set off some fireworks inside, that sort of thing. As the years passed by, the once scenic, now scary Subono became a popular haunted hotel for people to sneak into at night and test their courage on a long summer night. Also, according to a group of paranormal investigators that claimed to have once encountered a shimmering patch in the building, the site is an interdimensional portal. One of those places where the veil between our world and the world we can't see is at its thinnest. Sometimes so thin, it's an open door. Apparently numerous Japanese mediums refused to go near the site. Megumi and Narumi's friends not only went near the site, they went in and spent the night and claimed to have seen all sorts of stuff. When they could tell that Megumi and Narumi were scared, they made fun of the girls, ridiculing them for never having participated in a ki- kimo dameshi. One of the guys bragged about a ghost they'd supposedly seen. 
He told the girls about a tunnel running through a mountain near the hotel, told them that a little boy had opened the back seat door and fallen from his parents' speeding car in this tunnel a few years back. Jesus. Broke every bone in his body, arms and legs all twisted out of shape. He died on impact. Their friend said that if you drove through the tunnel at midnight now to the hotel and called out the boy's name, you might see him in your rear view mirror, running up behind your car, flailing his disjointed limbs as he tried to catch you. Ugh. He said they had seen this ghost. One of the girls, Megumi, wanted to know what would happen if you stopped when the ghost was chasing you. No one ever stops, he said. The girls were scared. They didn't tell their friend to stop teasing them with nonsense because they didn't think his story was nonsense. They believed it and so did he. And so it was the perfect challenge. The two young men teased the girls, told them they were cowards. Narumi told her friends that she and Megumi would do it. They were not cowards. They would brave Subono. She asked for the boy's name and got it. They'd stay the night and not leave no matter what until the following morning. And she was right. This is a fucking daring move. They would not leave the following morning or the morning after that or any mornings after that. They would head for Subono a few nights later and then no one would ever see them again. At least not alive. Narumi soon purchased a pen light, as well as some batteries for Megumi's flashlight. Then she met up with Megumi, and the two soon left for their test of courage. At approximately 9 p.m., both girls got into Megumi's car, a black Subaru v uh, Vivio, and began making their way to Uzu. They used a pager to tell their families that they were going to Uzu for a kim Kimo Dameshi. Midway along their journey, at around 9.30 p.m., they stopped off at Kayomaru Park in Imuzu Imizu City for around 30 minutes to tell some friends what their plans were before continuing along the trip. At around 10 p.m., the girls were spotted on a security camera refusing the car, or refueling the car at a petrol station in Yuzu before they left to continue into the moonlight. At around 11 p.m., one of the friends of Megumi and Narumi received a pager message from the girls letting them know they were now just a few minutes away from Subono. It would be the last time anyone would hear from the girls. Uh, yeah, that, that this evening. Uh, Megumi and Narumi vanished into thin air. When two full days had passed and they hadn't heard anything from the girls, the families of Megumi and Narumi reported them missing to the Toyama Prefectural Police. The initial, the initial search was focused around the Subono, since this was the last location the girls had likely made it to before disappearing. They later expanded the search area after finding no evidence of anything belonging to the girls at the hotel. They couldn't locate their car either, and they began looking around the surrounding cliff areas with a helicopter to see if they'd potentially fallen nearby. No trace of the girls, nor of their car, was found. Thinking the girls might have ran away, the police temporarily stopped searching, and the families waited a month to hear from them. After the month passed, and there had still been no word from the 19-year-olds, the Toyama Prefecture prefectural police decided to conduct a large-scale search for the missing girls. After the search turned up nothing, they tried again in October, retracing the girls' journey from Himi City to the old Subono Hotel each time. Despite thoroughly covering their route and also several different alternate routes between the two locations, police still could find no trace of the two. And with nobody else coming forward with any sightings of the girls with zero leads to follow, the searches were called off and the girls' disappearance quickly became a national mystery. The disappearance of Megumi Yashiki and Narumi Takumi became widespread news in Japan, and in the years since they'd vanished, many have proposed theories on what could have happened to them. The idea that they staged their disappearance and ran away together was a popular theory early on, especially with the Toyama Prefectural Police, but as time wore on, it became more and more unlikely that the girls could so thoroughly vanish if the goal was to keep living together under new identities. Also, neither had any strong motive to disappear. Their lives were not in shambles, they weren't on the run from anyone, they weren't buried in a massive amount of debt, they didn't seem to hate their parents, what reason would they have to start their lives over? Another disappearance theory revolves around the possibility of the girls running into members of a local biker gang who were known for visiting the abandoned hotel and then throwing raucous parties inside. Did some gang members do something to them? But again, this doesn't seem likely because there was no sign of the girls being hurt in the old building. The police thoroughly searched it. They found zero sign of any sort of violent struggle or assault. Also, the car was still missing. Then there was, of course, the theory that put this tale on our radar. What if the girls had arrived at the hotel and successfully contacted spirits and then something terrible happened? With no other leads, the case would soon grow cold and the mystery of Megumi Yashiki and Narumi Takumi's uh, Kimo Dameshe would itself become a tale to tell during Japan's spooker, spooky summer months for other paranormally adventurous teens. 24 years would pass before anyone knew anything about the missing girls. What? Then at midday on Wednesday, March 4th, 2020, the Toyama Prefectural Police, 
used a crane to pull a black Subaru Vivio wrapped in blue sheets from the seabed at Fushiki Port in Imizu City, located close to Kayumaro Park, where the girls had previously stopped during their journey. No way. Inside the vehicle were the skeletal remains of both Narumi Takumi and Megumi Yashiki, confirmed through DNA analysis. A gas station credit card with the name Yashiki Megumi in Boston was also found in the car. Since all the remains were the skeletons, it couldn't be determined if they had died from drowning or from other causes. With the car and bodies now found, the families of the two missing Himi City girls finally had closure on their fate, but the mystery around their disappearance had, if anything, deepened. In late 2014, uh, it turns out, three people had come forward to the Toyama Prefectural Police and claimed that they had witnessed a car matching the description of Megumi's fall into the port the night they went missing. Police initially dismissed their claim, why had they waited so long, but then decided to re-interview them again in January of 2020. The three anonymous witnesses told how at 12.30 a.m. on the night of the disappearance, they saw a black Subaru car with two female occupants inside parked along the edge of the cliffside at Kayumaro Park with the car's rear facing the water. As they approached the car from the front to speak with the girls, the car suddenly reversed and fell into the water. When asked why they had never come forward before, all three witnesses said the reason for not doing so was because they were scared, possibly of being accused of being responsible for what happened. Why had the girls started reversing? They knew that water was behind them. The possibility of a joint suicide had never come up in the initial investigations. There were zero warning signs anyone had seen that indicated this could have been a possibility, not that that makes it an impossibility. Why did the witnesses wait over 18 years to come forward? Why did the police sit on their information for another six years, knowingly leaving the bodies submerged underwater for over half a decade? Could it have been a horrible accident? Did the girls accidentally put their car into reverse? Were they spooked by the three witnesses who approached them? And by the time the accelerator was pushed, it was too late to correct their mistake. Seems unlikely. Maybe the three witnesses intentionally scared the girls as a prank. And then when they realized it had backfired, they felt responsible and guilty for their actions and decided to never speak of it again until their guilt became too much to bear and they finally, finally came forward. Again, seems unlikely. There is now a very upsetting rumor floating around that this disappearance uh, that might explain why the three witnesses took so long to come forward and why the police then waited so long to search for their car uh, where the witnesses told them it would be. According to this rumor, the three witnesses, who have remained anonymous, told friends and family what really happened. And then some of those people told others, and eventually their story made it to the internet where we found it. Supposedly, these witnesses claim that they weren't the only three people out there that night in addition to the girls. They say that when they approached the car, it wasn't because they were looking at the girls inside it. It was because of the thing they saw outside the car, oh. following it. They claim to have seen a disjointed thing, the figure of a mangled boy dragging its limbs. They watched it approach the car and climb inside through an open window. They then heard one of the girls scream as they watched this thing attack her, blood splattering into the inside of the windshield. Then the girl driving slammed the thing against the same windshield as she threw the car into reverse. The last thing the witnesses said they saw was the car careening into the ocean, and the face of a little boy pressed into the windshield, gaunt and twisted, blood pouring forth from its mouth. The police waited to act on this tip because, of course, it sounds crazy. But then they supposedly finally did act on it because more similar stories started coming in. More reports of a mangled boy chasing cars in the same area always at night. They remembered the witnesses' uh, outrageous claim, talked to them again, now decided to look into it. And then they found the remains of Narumi Takumi and Megumi Yashiki right where the witnesses said they would be. Today, the Subono Spa Hotel still stands in the Uzu Mountains, looming over the city from afar. And many in Japan continue to tell stories of hauntings during the summer months, and young people continue to test their courage. One wonders how long it'll be before another disappears. Ooh. That's interesting because as you were like, well, it could be mm -hmm. this, it could be that. I was like, yeah, probably. Uh -huh. But the, the way it all comes together at the end is really, really scary. Mm-hmm. Ah. Uh, Yeek. I, I wonder if the parents... Like approved of this, like oh yeah, that's you know like it's part of I tradition. That too. But they're nineteen. 
yeah, it's not that they so, need, but, but the way that mm. they were like, they, they got the pagers, they were letting right. them, they weren't hiding what they were doing. So no. I just wonder if like, as a part of culture, if it's just something right. like a rite of passage that everyone's like, oh yeah, yeah, my kids are out doing their yeah. test of courage, you know, tonight. I wondered that too, because uh, Japanese culture, traditional Japanese culture can be pretty patriarchal. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, women, just because they reach the age of 18, right. o- often still live very much under their parents, especially their father's thumb. Yes. And so I was like, huh, that's interesting, too. But maybe I, I kind of wanted the same thing. If because of tradition, mm-hmm. they re- maybe reluctantly okayed it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure now after a story like this yeah. gets so much press and the end result is so tragic. I right. wonder how that impacts a parent's choice. Like we're previously, yeah. if, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, no, it's fine. You know, it's like going to see fireworks with your friends, like whatever, you know, sort right, of traditional right. things that you do around specific holidays. Yeah. Yeah. God, that's awful. Yeah, I have a few pictures. This first one is the haunted Subono Hotel oh, near, okay. near where the girls disappeared. And uh, it's really not like that great of a hotel. It looks, I no, mean, I know it's, it's old older, now. And, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Like, okay. And all the windows were smashed out. There was a few yeah. pictures closer, closer up, but it's not like architecturally interesting. Inside, it's kind of exactly what you'd think. It's just like super trashed. Yeah. You know, uh, and then the, this next photo um, is a photo of Narumi Takumi and Megumi Yashiki. Okay. And then this final one has nothing to do with the story, but it just came up in the exact same search looking for these other pictures. And it's just called Scared Hamster, and it cracked me up. (laughs) And I guess it's a meme. It's like a little hamster who looks like he's just heard a terrifying story. (laughs) That is funny. (laughs) But that came up when you searched for the hotel? Yeah, that came up when I was looking into this story. It's like um, there was just one page of image kind of search results, and the last image was the little scared hamster. Weird. And I just couldn't stop looking at it, and I wanted someone else to see it. Thank you. Yeah. It's better than one of your weird, like, giant penis photos mm-hmm. or, like, you, you didn't try to make this one weird. I, no, I didn't. I just no, thought it was, it was really a, cute little, a cute little hamster. You know what else I was proud of? What? I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to say what? it at the beginning of the story. You got all of those pronunciations so well. Now, I don't know if I they're... practiced them before. I think I got them pretty close. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure someone with a native tongue might say, like, your oh, inflections are a little bit off, but... For Mushmouth Master <laughs> over there, I was like, holy I work, cow. I work at it. I'm trying to get I, better. It was really good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I was impressed. Uh, are you ready to travel from an abandoned haunt, haunted hotel in Japan to an operating haunted hotel in Miami? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a much more classic haunted hotel story. A decent amount of setup here again. Okay. Nestled on 150 acres, the sprawling Biltmore Hotel and Resort is full of endless possibilities and activities. The Biltmore is a luxury hotel and resort in Coral Gables, Florida, small city that butts up to Miami, uh, part of Miami's metro area. Rooms run from just under $300 all the way up to over $1,700 a night. No big deal. It looks like a pretty luxurious place to stay. I'll show some pictures at the end. Uh, pics will, of course, be on our social accounts, at Scared to Death Podcast, for anyone listening to check it out. Is this where you tell me that you've booked me a $17,000 <laughs> hotel room? <laughs> I have not. 1700 Oh, 1700. Yeah, I have not. Still insane. Uh, The hotel was built almost a century ago now. On November 24th, 1924, hotel magnate John McEntee Bowman announced that the $10 million project would consist of 400 rooms, a country club, a service building, a golf course, polo fields, tennis courts, and a large swimming pool. Really big. The largest hotel pool in the world when it opened. The fantastically opulent Biltmore opened on January of 1926. And over the next few years, nearly all of Miami's wealthy socialites would spend some of their nights at the Sea and Be Seen Hotel, fox trotting the night away, enjoying other amenities of the luxurious resort. Royals, dukes, duchesses, A-list celebrities stayed there in the 20s and 30s. Judy Garland, Bing Crosby, Franklin D. Roosevelt, a few of them. Uh, infamous mobster Al Capone liked this hotel. Sure he did. Capone was one of numerous Prohibition-era gangsters to have stayed at the Biltmore. Not all of them had a great time. On March 7th, 1929, just after midnight at a party on the 13th floor, notorious gangster Thomas Fatty Walsh was shot and killed during a gambling dispute. Whoopsies. Fatty Walsh was the bodyguard of Arnold Big Bankroll Rothstein, a man responsible for smuggling a lot of liquor into the country. Oh my gosh, Arnold Rothstein. Oh, what was that show? Boardwalk Empire. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, I can picture these characters. And the night he was shot and killed, there were roughly 100 people between the bar and gambling tables on the 13th and 14th floors. It was a black tie event complete with a lot of smuggled liquor. And that night, Ed Wilson, the casino owner, and Thomas Walsh just couldn't agree on who was robbing who. Well, I don't know the exact uh, nature of their dispute, the details. I know that Ed settled it by pulling out a revolver and shooting Walsh dead. And his spirit seems to have never left the Biltmore. And he's still causing problems. More on that in a second. Uh, 
During World War II, the Biltmore became the Army Air Force's uh, regional hospital. It remained a VA hospital until 1968, ran by the University of Miami Med School. A lot of veterans died at the Biltmore over the years. Some of them, like Fatty Walsh, seemed to have stayed. In 1973, the city of Coral Gables gained ownership of the hotel, and it remained unoccupied for almost a decade. That was when neighborhood kids started sneaking in to explore the grounds, and they started to claim seeing and hearing all kinds of spirits inside. In 1983, the city initiated a full restoration of the Biltmore. It would take four years and $55 million to put the Biltmore back in business. It reopened on December 31st, 1987, and after just three years and hundreds of claims of encounters with the paranormal, it closed again in 1990. In June of 1992, a hotel management firm took over, spent another $40 million, Good Lord! And another 10 years restoring the Biltmore. It reopened again in 2002 and has been operating and has remained full of ghosts ever since. And as guests have reported so many strange happenings over the years. People have claimed to have heard babies crying, people laughing, even loud parties. Some have seen a woman waving at them from the tower. One kind ghost reportedly opens doors for waitresses carrying heavy trays. Shadows have walked down halls and into walls. Extra guests have suddenly appeared on elevators. No ghost seems to have been spotted more than the supposed ghost of Fatty Walsh. He especially seems to like to uh, mess with elevators, always sending guests, regardless of what button they've pushed, to the 13th floor where he was shot. Mechanics have never been able to find anything wrong with the elevators. Sometimes he also writes threatening messages on mirrors, steals lampshades, turns lights on and off, that sort of thing. Generally, his intention seems to be to be to cause overall terror. And if it was his ghost, he definitely terrorized the subjects of the alleged modern encounter story I'll be sharing. After the grand reopening, Linda Spitzer was hired to tell ghost stories every Thursday night at the Biltmore. She's worked there until she worked there until 2004. Most of her stories came from guest experiences. Today's story comes from two guests who stayed at the hotel in 2003 who were trying to celebrate their honeymoon. Through a series of mutual connections, Linda Spitzer learned of it. The couple ended up staying only several hours, too disturbed by what they heard and saw at the historic Biltmore to stay the night. Time now for a tale called Leave. January 4th, 2003. After a beautiful ceremony and reception, Daniel and Aaron were ready to begin their honeymoon, eager to start their married life together. They were especially excited to be spending the next five days at the beautiful Biltmore Hotel and Resort. They spent months researching and saving and settled on the Biltmore as their honeymoon destination because it was close to their home in Miami and they'd scored a deal by getting married in the off season. Less demand meant cheaper rooms, beneficial for a couple on a budget. As excited as she was when Aaron and Daniel stood in front of the hotel's grand entrance, Aaron felt tense, antsy. Must be some residual nerves from the wedding, she told herself. Wow, Daniel whispered as they entered the lobby. Tall columns and arches curved high over their heads. Luxurious rugs and furniture filled the regal main lobby. Everything seemed to be covered in gold plating. They'd never stayed anywhere this nice in their entire lives. Tap, tap, tap. Aaron's gawking was interrupted by a gentle finger tapping on her shoulder. She jumped startled, turned around to see who touched her, and there was no staff members in sight. Or anyone else. The nearest person she could see was standing behind the front desk, uh, the front desk, the clerk. Why'd you just tap me? She asked Daniel. I didn't tap you, Daniel said absentmindedly, still taking in the lobby. So weird. I thought for sure I felt... I don't know, Aaron said, shrugging. Come on, let's get checked in, said Daniel, still a bit overwhelmed by all the luxury that surrounded them. We gotta go look around. This place is awesome. She smiled. She was probably gonna have to drag him away from the pool and the golf course, but she didn't mind. Aaron was eager to go to the spa herself. After checking in and heading up to their room, Daniel left her to go to the gym, not wanting to miss a workout. Aaron was exhausted and told him she'd rather stay in the room and get settled. But after 20 minutes had passed, she still hadn't done any settling. She didn't want to unpack her bags. They remained in a pile in the corner, reminding her of her unfinished task. It just didn't feel right to unpack yet. She chalked it up to more nerves from the wedding. After being stressed out for months over planning, all that anxiety probably just wouldn't go away overnight, she supposed. Maybe a long, hot shower was what she needed. Aaron turned on the water and soon steam filled the room as she opened the door and stepped inside the large tiled shower she immediately wished she had in her own house. It was perfect. Aaron allowed her thoughts to wander as she stood under the water. A few days before the wedding, she'd finally convinced Daniel to go to a psychic with her, she started thinking about. A friend had gifted her a visit during her bridal shower. It took days to talk him into it. Daniel insisted she was going to predict their deaths, divorce, some other tragedy, and he didn't want to hear it. He gave in when Aaron told him that if he went with her, she'd let him go golfing without uh, her without her one day on their honeymoon and not even complain about it. <laughs> the psychic didn't reveal anything surprising. 
Aaron already knew what she told them. The psychic could sense that Aaron wasn't a normal woman. Spirits from the other side were attracted to her. Aaron had known that since she was a little girl. Strange things had always happened to her. Hearing disembodied voices, other strange sounds. She'd even seen a ghost once. It wasn't scary, or it was scary, but also a relief in a way to finally see one of the things around her making all that noise. Aaron's belief in the paranormal was the only issue in their relationship where they really didn't see eye to eye. Daniel didn't believe in anything supernatural. Thought it was all fake stories meant to sell books and movies and hotel reservations. He never insisted Aaron was outright lying, but he thought she'd let her imagination get the best of her whenever she told him that she saw or heard something. You have to look out for her. The psychic told Daniel, imploring him with her large brown eyes, strange things might happen to her, bad things. Daniel kept silent, fighting the uh, urge to let out a, oh, come on, and shifting uncontrollably in his seat. Afterwards, he and Aaron had an argument. He insisted the psychic was just lying to make some money, feeding into Aaron's delusions about the supernatural. She felt like accusing the psychic of lying was accusing her of lying too. Flickering lights now snapped Aaron out of her thoughts. Why was she thinking about an old argument on their honeymoon? She'd almost started drifting off, never a good idea when one was standing in a slippery shower. The hot water was even more relaxing than she'd uh, realized. When she stepped out and grabbed a towel, she looked into the foggy mirror and noticed something strange. The letter L was written on the glass, as if someone had just come in and drawn it. That tense, edgy feeling was back. Taking a note from Daniel's book, she told herself about that getting worked up was pointless. Maybe it was all in her head. Someone had put the letter on the mirror before she'd checked in, and the grease on her finger just made the steam more reluctant to stick to it or something. She walked out into the room to wait for Daniel. A few minutes later, the door opened, and he entered, sweaty and out of breath. Hey, he grinned. Why are you sitting in the dark? He flicked on the light switch. Just as quickly, it was dark again. What was that? Aaron asked. Must have been a power surge. Daniel continued, flicking the light switch, walking over to test the lamps. Nothing. I can go down to the front desk, Aaron offered. See what's going on. I need to make a spa appointment anyway. Great. Just don't be long, he said with a smile that meant one thing. She was glad to see it. Maybe she needed sex even more than a hot shower to relax and get settled in. Just before she pulled open the door, the lights flickered back on. I was right, said Daniel. Power surge. Storm must be nearby. I'm still going to the desk to make my appointment. I'll be back in a few minutes, she said. Aaron wanted to get out of the room for a bit. She felt like she was going crazy, but she didn't want to mention anything to Daniel. She sensed something very different than a thunderstorm was behind their light problems, but she knew it would only cause an argument if she brought it up. Ding! The, eleva the elevator door slid open, revealing an empty elevator. They were staying on the third floor, and it only took a moment for Aaron to enter the lobby. Bright sunlight filtered into the windows. It didn't look wet outside. If a storm was nearby, it hadn't made it to the Biltmore yet. Shrugging off her strange feelings, Aaron approached the front desk and made her spa appointment. Is a storm rolling in? Aaron asked the clerk. Her brows scrunched together in confusion. Not that I know of. Weather's been perfect all day. Oh, it's just that our power went out for a second. We thought maybe a storm knocked it out. Well, we didn't lose power down here, and I didn't hear anything from the other guests. Please let us know if it continues happening. We'll be happy to transfer you to another room if you have any more problems. The clerk gave her a warm smile. Aaron turned around, preparing to go back to the room to spend some quality time with Daniel, as they sometimes called it. Hopefully a nice dinner, some time in bed, and an evening in the hot tub would ease her nerves. Her stomach was in knots, that constant feeling of anxiety that she'd had since they first entered the hotel just would not go away. The feeling was almost like dread. Yeah, that was it. Like she just knew that something bad was going to happen, but what? She was happily married on a honeymoon in a beautiful resort and had a loving husband waiting for her upstairs. Life was perfect right now, but something felt wrong. Ding! Aaron jumped as the doors opened again. Before she entered their room, she decided that she was going to go in there and forget about everything she was feeling. She wasn't going to let it ruin her honeymoon. If she ignored it, maybe it would go away. And her determination paid off. Aaron and Daniel spent some amazing quality time in their room before they decided to go downstairs for dinner. Ding! Once again, the elevator doors opened for them. It was still empty. Oddly, Aaron hadn't seen a single person on their floor or in the elevators. She'd seen a few guests outside in the lobby, but the huge hotel was nearly abandoned. Daniel pressed the lobby button. Instead of the familiar stomach-dropping feeling of a descending elevator, Aaron and Daniel felt themselves rising. The red numbers on the screen weren't changing, but the elevator was still ascending. What's going on? Aaron asked, starting to panic. Getting stuck in an elevator was one of her worst fears. It's fine, Daniel said as he put his arm around her. Someone above us probably pushed a button at the same time as me, so the elevator's coming up to get them first. Finally, the elevator stopped. Ding! Thirteen popped up on the small screen. Bright red numbers blinked like a warning sign. I thought hotels didn't have 13th floors anymore, Aaron said, her worry rising. This one's super old, remember? Daniel pressed the lobby button again. They waited. The doors weren't closing. Huh. 
Daniel stepped forward, poking his head out. No one's here. Aaron followed him as he stepped out into the hallway. The door shut behind her. The metallic thud filled her heart with dread. Restricted access, employees only, the sign in front of her read. The hallway was dusty, unused. Everything looked antique, much older than the modern finishes on the other floors. The 13th floor wasn't even an option on the elevator keypad. How did they get up here? Something wasn't right. Do you smell that? Daniel asked, wrinkling his nose in disgust. The powerful smell of cigars clouded the air, burning their nostrils, nearly choking them. It was like someone was standing right in front of them, puffing clouds of smoke into their faces. The employees must sneak up, sneak up here for smoke breaks, Daniel shrugged. Let's just find the stairs. We'll report the elevator trouble to the front desk when we get down. Aaron eagerly agreed, grabbing his hand and following him. As they made their way to the right, Aaron felt her anxiety intensify. She felt someone watching them, following them. She looked over her shoulder every few seconds, but there was nothing. No one. Wait, Aaron whispered. Do you hear that? It was people talking, laughing, soft jazz music, the clinking of glasses. It sounded like there was a party just ahead of them. I do, he said. Daniel was tense, eyes wide in fear. This party did not sound like one that was actually happening now. It sounded like one that had happened a long, long time ago, like the echo of a party. Rather than feeling validated by Daniel finally having a paranormal experience, him hearing what she was hearing only made her more afraid. He sighed. Come on, let's just leave. This place is kind of giving me the creeps. He pulled Aaron along with him, making right turns. The sound of the party was getting louder, closer. Daniel came to a sudden stop, halting Aaron with a jerk on her arm. They were facing the entrance of a large ballroom, now abandoned. Chairs covered with fabric and covered in dusk. The dust, the carpet, was worn and faded, and it was silent. Right before they'd stopped, the noise had peaked, like they were just entering the party. But now, complete silence. And the powerful smell of cigars, once again seemingly being blown into their faces. Tap, tap, tap on her right shoulder. Aaron jumped, screaming. As she turned around, BANG! A loud pop like a gun sounded off behind her. A woman screamed. Disembodied voices began to shout incoherently. Daniel grabbed her arm, turning past the ballroom and running down the hallway. A doorway to the stairs lay ahead of them like a beacon of safety. Thankfully, the door wasn't locked. Daniel pushed it open, running down the stairs and dragging a terrified Aaron with him. They ran as fast as they could, down the stairs, not stopping until they were in the safety of the lobby with other people around them. Daniel, she said, breath coming in short pants. Everything's okay. That was just... Hell, I, I don't know what that was. There must be a party going on somewhere that we couldn't see. Maybe they're having fireworks or something. It's fine. We just got a little sc scared. Aaron stared at him incredulously. You know that's not what just happened. He threw up his hands in frustration. Okay, fine. Yeah, it was something else. Ghosts or something. Oh my God. So what, what do we do? I think we just ignore it. The more you think about these things, the worse it gets. Isn't that what people say? Let's just get out of here. Let's just go have dinner. Let's try and forget about it at least for tonight. For once, she agreed with him. Although she desperately wanted to understand what had happened, what if thinking about it gave it more power? She told herself that they could think about it all they wanted when their honeymoon was over. But of course, doing that would be impossible. It was all either one of them could think about during dinner, and dinner was tense. They both jumped every time a waiter approached them, or if someone's voice got too loud, every time a glass clinked. They decided to forego the hot tub in favor of their room. They hoped a long night of sleep would refresh them for tomorrow. They could rest up and enjoy the rest of their honeymoon in peace. Daniel could still tell that Aaron was very tense. He was freaked out himself, but she looked like she was taking, uh, it was taking everything she had not to bolt from their room and keep running until she got to their car. In an effort to calm his anxious wife, he, uh, he told her to lay down while he drew a bath for her, a bath she would never take. Daniel would return to her completely freaking out a few minutes later, and Aaron wouldn't learn exactly what had happened to him for months. Daniel entered the bathroom, filling the tub with hot water. After about a minute, steam started to fill the room, fogging up the mirror. He put a few drops of lavender into the tub, then turned around to let Aaron know her bath was ready and paused. So sweet. L. Someone had written an L on the mirror. There was nothing there before, and he knew Aaron hadn't entered the room with him. E. He watched horrified as the letter E was being written right in front of his eyes on the steamy mirror. A. He could smell cigars again. V. That invisible finger now drew another letter on the mirror. You're tired, Daniel. You're making this up, he told himself. E. Leave! It read. Daniel had never been so scared in his life. The air felt heavy, and he had the overwhelming feeling that someone was behind him, and not someone nice, a threatening, menacing presence. Springing into action, Daniel stormed into the room, grabbed his bag, and tossed his things inside. We're leaving now, he ordered Aaron. What's going on? She placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. What is wrong? We just, we have to leave, okay? There is something in here. I can't explain it, but we have to leave. It is not safe. 
Something had clearly happened in that bathroom. Aaron flashed on the letter L she'd seen earlier. Without any argument, the couple packed their bags and checked out, speeding away in their car. I'm sorry I ruined our honeymoon, Aaron, but we just can't stay there anymore. Just tell me what happened. You know how he felt something on the 13th floor? I felt it again, but stronger in the bathroom. It told me to leave. He refused to say any more, obviously still terrified by whatever he saw. He didn't want to talk about it. I'm sorry, he said a few minutes later, breaking the silence. I'm sorry I never believed you. Aaron forgave him. She understood that it was hard to accept. She still didn't fully understand what had happened to them inside that hotel herself. It was 10 p.m. when they'd left. They'd only lasted about seven hours. They managed to find another hotel, not as nice as the Biltmore, but also not terrifying. After leaving the Biltmore behind, the couple were able to finish their honeymoon in peace. No more letters on the mirror. No more smell of cigars. No more tapping. No phantom gunshots. None of it. They happily laid out by a much smaller pool. And Daniel skipped playing golf. Neither one left the other side for anything other than bathroom breaks for the rest of the honeymoon. And when they took those bathroom breaks, they made sure they did so only when there was no steam on the mirror. Man. Mm Mm-hmm. That was Uh. an intense experience. You're, immediately, I was like, did they get their money back? <laughs> <laughs> you a ghost refund? Well, I just, I mean, I always think about money. I'm like, oh, man, that yeah. sucks. Such a waste of money. Mm-hmm. I'm so weird about that. Uh, wow. Mm-hmm. I love that the husband, yeah. finally, <laughs> uh-huh. came to her side. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I figured you would. Daniel. <laughs> Maybe it's a little uh, omen for you. <laughs> I thought that part would uh, please you. Uh, it did, greatly. Uh, let's look at a few pictures. This first one is the Biltmore shortly after it opened in 1926. Wow-wee. This place is badass. Wow. The, those little, it's hard to see from here, but that's uh, cars in front of it. Mm-hmm. Just to show kind of like the, the scale. Yeah. And Giant. Then, and then this next one, more much more recent picture of, of the pool, part of the pool. Oh, that's so nice. Looks so nice. Oh, my God. I can't wait for vacation. <laughs> uh, recent pic of the Biltmore featured in Architectural Digest is this next picture. I love Architectural Digest. I mean, it's massive grounds. Massive. It reminds me of, um, oh, what does it remind me of? The shape of it. I can't. Mm. Uh, it'll uh, come to me later. Lagio? Oh. oh. Yeah, good call, Joe. <laughs> yes, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, it does have that vibe. Joe, is it the, do you, how did you know that? Because I've been to Bellagio's a lot. <laughs> it's a fun place. <laughs> uh, Fancy pants. This next one's a nice spook- spooky pic of the hotel. I love when people just, you know, kind of darken up the photos a little bit. Yeah. Well, that just looks like a storm rolling in. Mm-hmm. And then this last one, this is just a pic of that lobby that mm-hmm. they were talking yeah, yeah, about. Because yeah. I tried to find the best picture of it, but I mean, it's Holy really hell. cool. Yeah. Oh, I love a good hotel lobby. Mm-hmm. All those uh, pillars and arches. Yeah, very cool. I love those green velvet couches. Mm-hmm. Oh, so pretty. Very cool. That's a great story. Yeah, I liked it. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, I know that you found that one, but I wonder how many more like that exist, I you know, I... all over the place. Well, they had that one lady for years. I don't know who they do it anymore, yeah. but, you know, telling weekly stories. I bet they have quite a few. I get yeah. the feeling they have a lot of stories from that hotel. I have a hard time with all the money they spent on continually restoring. I know. Like it, Ooh, it, big investments. It's so tough for me in those situations. I know this is not how money works, but in, it inherently bothers me. I'm yeah. like, so still no clean water in Flint, Michigan, but like we can spend $55 million well, and 40 I know. Yeah. I know that's not how it works. Right. I can't help it. That's where my brain goes. Where I'm like, really? Do we need another fucking opulent hotel where yeah. the money could go to social causes? I know. I know. It just irritates me on a like a personal level. I'm not even saying that that's like what is even an option for those businesses. It's just like there is so much wealth. Yes. And it gets used in ways that I oftentimes don't understand. I mean, I will I will say in this instance, it's uh, wealth that's not being donated. It's being invested. Mm-hmm. So they're spending a lot of money to make a lot more money back. Yes, but they could invest that money in their own community and then make money a different way. Or you meant like another, uh, I, I got you. Yeah, yeah you make yeah, money yeah. by investing in your community. But, sure, but, sure. Okay, and then you were talking about that giant pool. It brings me back. I don't know. Recently, I was telling you about that giant pool in Dubai. I mentioned it like oh, yeah. either on 99 or 100. Mm-hmm. Did you open that I link did, that I, I sent did you last I did open night? the link and I did look. It's pretty amazing. It's fucking crazy. It's yeah. 196 feet deep. It is the deepest pool in the world. It has, it, an, it, it has an arcade and pool, to, like foosball, yes! down at the bottom. Like people with diving uh, gear on were playing. They had, like actual arcade games that were like waterproof. And it was so cool. It was cool. really cool looking. Yeah, and they put like fake abandoned cities down there so you could kind of go uh, exploring. And, and speaking of opulent. Oh my gosh, I know. Dubai. 
I would love to go there. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's safe. Seems to be the most like decadently like lavish city in the world. Yeah, as all far that as. oil money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It would be really cool to see. Yeah. I know Monroe will like send me links randomly. She'll be reading articles and there's like, you know, uh, this mall with like an indoor water park. I, but yeah. it, it's not like, it's I not like to, Mall of America water park. Uh, it's like ridiculously over the top. I think Dubai has the world's largest indoor mall, world's deepest pool, and world's tallest building right now. They are crushing it. Mm-hmm. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I want to check it out someday. Yeah. Yeah. I think you have to like, I don't know. I probably can't wear any makeup. I probably have to cover my face the whole time. I think like the rules are so strict. Yeah. They probably won't like my tattoos. Oh, you probably have to. I'm not, I'm not kidding. You'd probably have to wear long sleeves the whole time. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't I don't know how that works for visitors. I, I think the, the rules are more relaxed for visitors. Mm-hmm. You don't have to. You wouldn't have to wear anything covering your face. I've seen plenty of pictures. I would be, but I would. I mean, if that was like what the. What it took to go. Yeah, yeah, if it did, but it won't. It, it doesn't, I'm it doesn't always right respectful now. of other yeah. cultures that way. I don't have a problem, you know, doing what they do. It doesn't yeah. matter what I think about it or what yeah, I believe yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. It's like, well, it is what it is. Whoo we. Okay. Well, are you ready? I'm ready. To be a good sport yes. about crystals. I just think that this story is gonna have us all divided. You and I and fans alike. Okay. Of like, you know, okay, so this this fan Nikki, she has a story about a crystal asterisk maybe is it a crystal Mm -hmm. is it just a rock is it something else um but it it seems to have wreaked havoc not only on her life but also someone else in her life yeah okay do you promise you're gonna be good (laughs) i do i'm I'm really nervous okay okay i'll be good i'll be good it starts off right i'll be good i'll no eye rolls okay 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 so just for like a little background the Mm -hmm. crystal in question she thinks is a citrine which is also known as yellow quartz and if you're going to go that route, mm-hmm. uh, it's meant to be a healing crystal used for positivity and optimism and to awaken the solar plexus. And the solar plexus is a real thing. I did want to... Well, I know the solar plexus is a real thing. Okay, what is it? It's part of your body. Mm-hmm. It's like like your solar plexus is right beneath your sternum. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. It, and it affects the function of your stomach and your adrenal glands and your liver. Okay. And things of the sort. Okay, right. so like if your solar plexus is blocked, yeah, citrine would like help you open it up. Theoretically. Mm-hmm. I see the struggle in your face already. Okay. I'm being good. I'm being good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wish that I could change your face sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You just, you wear your emotions on your face. I'm okay. 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 I've been a listener for a little over a year and I'm finally all caught up on my episodes. Love the stories. Love the dynamic duo. I'm a fan for life. Thank I thought oh, I thought Lindsay would appreciate the story because crystals, and I thought Dan would appreciate it because he can rub it into Lindsay that they don't always bring good. This is a personal story of mine from a couple years ago. My best friend, Chloe, and I went to an art fair in town. One of our friends who wire wraps crystals and makes beautiful jewelry had a booth there, and we decided to pay her a visit. While at her booth, I was going through a little scrap bucket of pieces she couldn't use, and found what I thought looked like a polished piece of citrine. I paid her $2 and took it home. As I do with all new crystals, I cleansed this one in a bowl of salt and sat it in the windowsill to charge overnight. Hmm? Good job. When I checked on it the next morning, it had holes going through it from one side to the other. And it also had this like cave that had formed through one side of it where some salt had collected. I tried researching to see which crystals would corrode in salt. I thought maybe it wasn't citrine after all, but my searches ended up with no conclusive results. I then went to work and decided to ask my 50-something-year-old boss, who had been pagan his whole life and has generations of the religion in his family, if he knew what type of crystal could corrode in salt. He looked at me puzzled, so I explained what had happened, and his eyes went wide. He said, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it now. Think about it. If the salt is there to cleanse out any negative energy, how much negative energy must it take to eat holes through something? And his point made sense to me. I went home and told my now ex-fiance Jack what my boss had said. Jack instead decides he wants to experiment with it and puts it in a bigger bowl of salt and sticks the bowl in the garage. I was frustrated that he didn't listen to me when I said I wanted to get rid of it, but I thought... Okay, one more day, I'll humor him and then get rid of it. When we checked on it the next day, this rock looked like Swiss cheese. It had new holes and craters formed in it. 
A couple weeks had gone by, and we still had not gotten rid of this rock. Jack thought it was fascinating and wouldn't let me throw the damn thing into the lake. Jake and I, uh, Jack and I, had been fighting nonstop, and the fights had gotten somewhat scary. I told Chloe all about this rock and that I was scared that there was something attached to it. She said, look, I'll hold on to it for a couple weeks and you'll see there's nothing bad about it. A couple weeks later, she gave it back to me saying that she didn't notice a difference. However, the two weeks that she'd had the crystal at her house was during the same time her significant other experienced a huge mental decline and was experiencing heavy depression and then moved back in with her parents an hour away, effectively ending her and Chloe's relationship. With the crystal back in my possession, things with mine and Jack's relationship hit an all-time low. The fights were violent and mentally abusive. I had to stay with Chloe several times because I didn't feel safe. My belongings were being broken, walls were being punched, and after and punched after one night of being truly scared, I decided to end things with Jack. Things were un- these things were uncharacteristic of him, but I could not stay and watch them get worse. Good. I moved in with Chloe, but kept in contact with Jack. We shared custody of our dog, and I still wanted to be friends with him. I mean, this whole thing didn't feel like the real him. About a week after I moved out, Jack called me one one night crying. He said he had heard crying coming from our spare bedroom, so he had thought I had come home. When he opened the door, no one was there. When he walked back out into the living room to go back to bed, he saw a bright red flash of light in the kitchen, heard a loud pop, and then again heard crying in the bedroom next to him. To be honest, I thought he was fabricating the whole thing to try and get me to come back. That is, until a couple days later, when he emailed me a video he had taken. I opened my email to see an attachment with the subject line, I'm not crazy. I opened the video to pretty much nothing but darkness. I can hear him and our dog get out of bed and walk to the bedroom door. There is enough light that I can see his feet walk down the hallway, our dog leading the way. I can hear her her audibly sniffing as they head towards the spare bedroom. I then hear him say, hello? Who's there? Then he asks to himself or maybe even the dog, what the hell was that? Then I heard it. I heard the crying. It sounded female and muffled. I had chills all over my body as I hear Jack in the video gasp followed by a low growl and our dog barking as they both run back to the bedroom and the video ends. I knew this wasn't our dog growling in the video that low and deep. She's an eight pound chihuahua that's incapable of growling like that. After watching, I told him I would come over to smoke cleanse the house. I opened the back sliding glass door, turned on all the lights in the house and turned off the TV. It was quiet. Jack was in the kitchen and her dog was napping on the sofa. Going room to room with a stick of incense, reciting my usual, all negative energy must leave this place. Only positive energy is allowed here, mantra. I entered the hallway where the spare bedroom resides and the hall light began to flicker. I backed out of the hallway and it stopped. I tried it again. I entered the hallway and again and again the lights started to flicker. I stepped into the spare bedroom where Jack had heard the crying. The hall light is just going absolutely berserk at this point, flickering out of control. I'm making sure to get smoke in all of the corners of the room. Our dog abruptly woke up and is barking as loud as he can, running to the back door. The blinds were swaying like crazy, even though there was no breeze on this warm summer night. Our dog was in the backyard, barking her head off at some invisible thing that she was absolutely fixated on. We called her back in and shut the door. The blinds stopped moving and the hall light had stopped flickering. About a week and a half went by without hearing any bizarre crying or other phenomena before Jack told me he heard it again. I told him whatever it was, it had to be attached to that stone. The problem was he couldn't find it anymore. We tore up bedrooms and looked in all the cabinets behind furniture. The thing just went up and missing. A month later, after countless nights of of him telling me about hearing more crying, seeing more weird lights, he found it. His landlord was selling the house, and while packing, he found it in the spare bedroom where the crying had been coming from, wedged between the computer desk and the baseboard of the wall. He told me he had gotten rid of it after that, but he did not. He only kind of got rid of it. He apparently stuck it inside a hole in a stone wall outside the apartments that he lived right next to. He said he wanted to take it to a psychic to see if they could tell him anything about it. 
but in the following months, he experienced severe depression, terrible nightmares, and became an all-around negative person. I can't understand why he refuses to separate from this thing. Maybe whatever is attached to it is still calling out to him. Best wishes to Lindsay and Dan. Keep up the phenomenal work. I'm going I'm going to go listen to this week's episode right now. Nikki. Wow, Nikki. That's a, an intense story. That is a It's a weird, very, right? Yeah, it's very weird. And and I and I I do find it very interesting how it's all centered around that particular crystal. Yeek. Yeek. I mean, I guess if I'm entertaining all these other possibilities, there could be something there. Yeah. Well, I mean, who's to say spirits, energies can't attach to just about anything? Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk about like mirrors, uh, you know, paintings with eyes moving, a haunted house is a thing, a haunted house, a Ouija board is an object. Right. Right. I mean, it's like. Okay. Interesting. Right. It could be anything. Yep. True. I don't know why. Right. I was thinking back. God, this was a while ago. Do you remember a long time ago? I told this story, uh, a mom had taken her kids on a road trip and they have gone, oh man, south, like maybe the Dakotas and they had gotten, you know, they found like arrowheads or whatever and they had brought an arrowhead or a stone or a rock or a crystal back Mm -hmm. and then there were all these issues in their house until they got rid of it Yes, and they had thought that like maybe they'd taken it from a burial ground. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I mean, you know. We talked about, yeah, things attaching themselves to objects. Yeah, you know, you're right. Yeah. And how sad that it just ruined their yeah, that, relationship. Yeah. Two relationships, potentially. Because mm-hmm. it sounds like both relationships were normal, mm-hmm. whatever that is. Mm-hmm. And then, and the fact that he won't get rid of it. That is really... I know, that was a good spooky end. I mean, not good. Uh, not good, good for him. Good spooky ending in the sense of hearing a spooky story. Not good for your Jack at all. Yeah. Yeah. Jack, if you're listening, get the fuck get out. Get that rock out of there. Get it out of there, man. So speaking of objects. Yeah. Okay. Uh... I was like, what do we know about objects and Ouija boards? Basically, with Ouija boards, I feel like we know they never lead to anything good. <laughs> We've never had a story that I can think of where someone used a Ouija board and it was like, oh, it was so great. I talked to my dead mom and it was awesome and nothing bad ever happened again. I mean, they might be out there, but we uh, we haven't told them. Yeah. Right. And I guess we're not looking for that. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a you find what you seek out. Right. But well, there certainly are plenty of bad stories. Yeah. Thinking about that, like you've mentioned wanting to do a little... Ouija board session. Yeah, maybe. You still open to it? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. But what if, but you know what's all bad. I know, I know. I, that's why I've kind of like pulled back away from it. Okay. I'm a little little nervous about it now. Okay, well, I think that this story will push you more into the, no, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, now, this is the story that I said. I just want to give like a little warning. <laughs> As I wear a Ouija board theme shirt. Well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, it's, it's, um, it's not authentic. It's <laughs> okay. fine. Uh, okay, so... This story is 100% true. The person who sent it in sent me the article that pertains to it, but I've el- eliminated some details that don't affect the story just because I want to protect. There are still yeah, people yeah. around, and I think their privacy deserves to be protected. And again, for anyone who has kids that listen, it's not that it's... It, it is a scary, creepy story, but it, the violence factor, I don't know. It just hung with me personally. Maybe it's me. Maybe yeah. it's not. Oh, is that decapitated? Decapitated Layla? It is. It's from last week when I ripped the head off and threw it at you. Yeah. And you scared it, I, me? I, yeah, I scared you really you good. You scared me so bad. Mm-hmm. Scared you, or you scared li- me so good. <laughs> literally scared you into tears. Literally. That's the second time you've scared me into tears. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I kind of like just the head is a good squishy size. It smells good, yeah. Oh, do the inside smell good? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I like her little body. I know. Her body looks a little rough. Oh, Trayla. We could glue her back together. All better. She's so cute. Okay. Well, here we go. Okay. Hello to the STD and Time Suck team. It's Justin, eliminating last name, from the Department of Caffeinated Beverages, Uh, Kansas City, Kansas Division. Hi, Justin. Dan, you're a massive inspiration to so many like myself. Please never stop doing what you're doing. Lindsay, you're an excellent host of my favorite horror podcast and a wonderful support pillar for our beloved leader of the Suckiverse. That's so cute. <laughs> that is very nice. Creeps and peepers, keep on keeping on. Love to you all. Down to brass tacks. <laughs> I have a story for you that you may find as bone chilling as I do that I'm hoping to share it with a few people on this flat earth that I hold dear. For context, <laughs> the family. That's a joke, by the way, for uh, reference to oh my yeah, stuff, for if, if you had no idea. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for a little bit of context, the story is about the family. Pat, my best friend, his older brother, Jake, 
younger sister, Allison, mother, Cheryl, father, Peter, and foster sister, Jennifer, and foster brother, George. Okay. Okay. This is broken down into three parts, so it, w- it will be easy to track gotcha. the people. Okay. Part one, the house, Caswell Street, Massachusetts. The house in question is the place I spent most of my childhood. My parents were childhood friends of Pat's, and that turned into an early and lifelong friendship ever since we were in diapers. There was always something wrong with the house as far as I can remember. Strange noises, feelings of being watched, and seeing strange things were a common occurrence. Jake, unfortunately, took the brunt of the horrors through childhood to the point that he had pushed a dresser in front of a stairwell door that led to his room on the second floor because he didn't want to see the old lady anymore. Man. I will elaborate later on her. He was tormented by her on so many occasions that he opted to move his room to a finished part of the basement that would prove to be a mistake. The next few years were filled with night terrors, sleep paralysis, and shadow figures. Eventually, it got bad enough that he moved out and got an apartment, only to lose it and ended up and end up back in that awful apartment. I only saw her one time, but that was enough that I never went into the basement alone again. I was looking for Pat and Allison and figured they might be down in Jake's room. Upon entering the basement, I found it empty except for a few noises coming from the laundry area. Thinking it might be them, I started walking over. And that's when I saw her. An old, rotten-looking hag. She was shaking while walking like something out of a ring movie. Totally surreal. Big yellow eyes and bony hands like a demon. She turned to look at me, and I bolted up the stairs as fast as possible, never again to return to that basement. I could go on and on about all the creepy shit that went on there. This was a house of a classic get-the-fuck-out-but-stuck-here-because-of-money situation. Anyway, around the time I was eight, they started adopting foster teens. There were plenty that came, got the love and support they needed, and went off to college or work to make room for the next needy teen. It was a great thing they did and helped a lot of people. But then there was Jennifer, and everything changed. When I was about 10, they adopted Jennifer. Jen was the second to last foster kid that would ever step into Cheryl and Pete's house. She was 18, beautiful, smart, and headed in a good direction. She was always fun and sunny, and to be honest, I think my older brother had a crush on her and th- as they were about the same age. The only thing she had going against her was living in that house, specifically in the bedroom on the first floor. For some reason, that was the room that so many of the foster kids had had bad experiences with unexplained entities, a hot spot, if you will, for the unknown. She was there for a few years, always creeping out us younger than her with her creepy tales that she offered up about her room. About two years in, she made a classic Darren move and bought a Ouija board. Not a Parker Brothers mass-produced toy, but an old wooden one from a local flea market. Not sure how many times she used it, but I do remember the last time like it was yesterday. We were helping her do some spring cleaning a few weeks before she was heading off to college. She had opened a drawer on her nightstand, holding out the board, staring at it. She broke it in half over her knees and then threw it in the trash. Pat and myself both witnessed this and said nothing about it and just continued to help her clean her room so that the next foster kid would have a nice, clean, blank blank slate in a few weeks. Cut to a few days later, me and Pat are playing 007 GoldenEye on N64 (laughs) when we hear Jen scream. We ran into the room and there she is, holding that fucking Ouija board in her hands. Not broken, no tape or glue to hold it together. She found it under her mattress while she was flipping it. We were all freaked out, but being, but, but her being the older and more rational one in the room, she calmly said, it's okay, I'll just take it with me to college and freak out my roommates. Jump ahead to the day she leaves. She loads up the car and heads out for Boston University, Ouija board packed in the car and drives away. She never made it to her dorm. She was killed in a car accident on the way, and the reason for the wreck was never disclosed. She was a sweet soul cut short and will never leave our memories. The last chapter in this story sometimes makes me think that we are better off not knowing what may have happened to her if she had stayed. Part 3. George George was a beast, weighing in at 270 pounds and stood 6 foot 5. Muscle upon muscle, he was built like an NFL line line backer and he was very cool. He always made sure the family was safe. He even came to a few fights to protect Jake and my older brother, Corey. 
He always laughed with us and told stories while smoking weed. I was about 14 and he was just a nice guy to be around, but a scary one to cross. He was family as far as we were concerned and us to him. He stayed in Jennifer's old room for about a year before the house finally took its toll on him. I remember the first day he changed. Me and Pat woke up from a long night of playing our video games and were headed downstairs to make our favorite breakfast, a whole loaf of toast with butter. We peered out the window to see George sitting in the garden, cross-legged, as if meditating. Suddenly, he sprang up to his feet, walked over to the basketball hoop, you know, the kind with water or sand in the bottom to hold it down? Mm -hmm. He jumped up, grabbed it by the rim, and threw it like a toothpick across the yard. Needless to say, we were afraid of him for the very first time. Over the next two weeks, he was definitely not himself, arguing with Cheryl and throwing things around. A few days later, right before dinner, he walked into the living room with a raw steak in his hands, slapped Pat in the face with it and said, do you see what they want me to do? Do you see what they want me to do for them? Then walked away and went to his room. Totally weird and very unsettling. A few days after that, the house was full on a Sunday morning. The smell of smoke woke Allison and she walked to the top of the stairs. All of the bedrooms were on the second floor except for George's. She ran to wake her parents and her brothers so that they might escape safely from the burning house. It turned out that just a few minutes before, George had poured a can of gasoline all over himself and then sat on the couch and set himself on fire. Oh my God. If that sounds scary, We aren't quite done yet. The family raced out of the second story window in Pat's room since the stairs were being engulfed with flames. Everyone made it out of the house as they turned the corner to drive away and to the driveway. And there was George. He had been sitting in the fire until this very moment. His flesh was smoking, melting off his muscles. He was wielding two kitchen knives and looking right into Pat's eyes and said, what's the matter, bro? Don't you love me anymore? What? and then began stabbing himself in the stomach and chest. Needless to say, this messed Pat up for years, and eventually he and Allison turned to drugs to remove the memories. They both have since made a full recovery. The fire department finally showed up along with a police officer. George rushed the fire truck and tried to stab a firefighter until he was blown off his feet by the fire hose. Despite his seemingly fatal injuries, he rose back to his feet and rushed a second time only to be hit with the fire hose yet again, which took him out of his shoes as some of his skin and muscles peeled off with the blast. What? He was taken to Morton Hospital and then the Taunton State Mental Hospital where he stayed for a few years before being released. He lived? When we mustered up enough courage to visit him, he was greatly disfigured and a mere shell of the man we had once known and loved. He had no recollection of the incident and only knew it through the news stories that he had heard. He had nothing except apologize. He had nothing except apologies for us. He kept telling us how much he loved us. The last thing he said still sticks with me to this day. He leaned in and said, you know, the house made me do it. It wasn't my fault. Whatever I did or they said I did, I don't remember any of it. Every night it was shadows and demons for me. I knew that staying there was bad for me, but I was trying to protect you all from that damn house. We've never spoken to him since, but I have seen him working for the state of Massachusetts as a highway repair person or whatever it is they do. As for the house, after the fire, a new house was built on that property. I hope that whatever was there left the night of the fire. What the fuck? And they, he did send me a link to an article, and I, I read. I was like, "Oh my god!" Like you, right? So the, the now the Ouija board after the car fatal car accident never came back to the house, right? But the Ouija no. board came from the house. Yes. So, so I think I was I was thinking about it. I like that he told it in three parts because it's like part one: the house is weird uneasy yeah, yeah, yeah. right and like he's saying it feels like a hot spot it feels like something's not right in the house then jen brings in the ouija board right so then does that just intensify it yeah does she create oh, more more space for demons to come in i don't know what like what happens to her what happens when she uses the ouija board right, right? and then that causes costs her her life possibly yeah right i mean yeah, we don't that's know a, that's a crazy intense story and then george <sighs> Right? Right? That's fucking crazy. That's some haunting imagery. 
I know. My God. Okay, I'm glad that you're having that reaction. So I wasn't that's overreacting by like saying maybe kids shouldn't hear this one. I mean, that's very intense. It's burning and then stabbing yourself and then saying all this creepy shit and then and having then to get surviving? blasted and surviving and then still thinking it's the house these years later and the mental institution. I mean, Jesus Christ. Yeah. If, if uh, honest to God, if there wouldn't, if there hadn't had been a news article attached to it, I don't know that I would have included it because I would have thought this is complete and utter fucking bullshit. Like someone, this is just someone trying their hand at writing the creepiest, craziest mm-hmm. thing they could write. Yeah, but you said you found like verification online. No, Man, the, the author sent it to me, and then oh, I right, right, yeah, I followed, and then and then I looked, and I was like, holy yeah. shit! Yeah, that's really scary. Really fucking scary. What? I, I, I can't. I cannot. That, that, I mean, oftentimes we come across houses where I'm like, oh, I'd still stay there. That particular house, fuck that. Fuck that. And there's no way, I mean, I don't know how. I mean, like, obviously the house is gone, but like even the new house. No I, way. I wouldn't even want to walk on those grounds. Nope, nope. After I wouldn't drive that down crazy that fucking shit. street. Yeah. No way. Yikes. Yikes. Oh. Yeah, they gave me the chills, big time chills. It kind of gave me like a sick feeling in my stomach. I know, I know. It is really unsettling. That's, I mean, yes, it's scary. Uh, yes, it's George. creepy, but it's like My God. so disturbing. Yeah. Which sometimes is more scary than anything else. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would way rather see a fucking shadow man than any of that oh, shit. Oh, yeah, me too. Me too. Oof. Ay, ay, ay. You want to do Annabelle's first? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that story is heavy. That's heavy. That's mm-hmm. heavy. Okay. I'd like to thank the following Annabelle's for supporting the show. Oh, boy. I might have given myself some of the hard names. Okay. Okay. Kate mm, Kamu. Man, I don't know. C O Kam Kamu? C O M E A U. Kamo? Kamo? Kate Kamo. Kate Cuomo. <laughs> Jordan Rodriguez. Ryan Asplund. Mary Muffins. Amber Scar. Layla Kathleen. Jose Venta. Cody Varnador. Stephanie Brinkman. Kristen Miller. Cameron Vogler, Luciano Duarte, Emma Skinner, Dylan Lewitt, Ron Hayes, April Sanders, Chelsea Jones, Arya Taylor, Tay C, Shelby T, My Stranger, <laughs> Lori Bradley, Jacob Ramirez, Sergio uh, Avila Acevedo, Enrique Gutierrez, and Capilla, no, Capilla Priscilla. <laughs> And I'd like to thank the following Annabelles, Taylor Dudley, Claire Belletter, Levi Sizemore, Danny's Bahamut Size Math Class Oops Boner, <laughs> Tiana James, Milton Campbell. Oh, I've known Milton for years. Uh, Milton's an aw- awesome guy. He was in Hawaii, serving in the uh, military for a long time. Oh, Met cool. him early on doing a show in Portland, a college show. He's a great dude. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Moa Fai, uh, Jesse Ash. Jesse Davis, Davies, excuse me, Ryan Allen DeGroot, Katie Conyers, Daniel, two R, or maybe that's a typo, two R's, Daniel Rippey, uh, Don Seymour, Carrie Ann Rin, Luis Velasquez, uh, Velasquez, uh, Billy Solis, Kyle Puchanewski. Pushinowski? Pushinowski, very Polish. Uh, I know. I wrote it out and then I like I could say it in my brain and then I made sure that the spelling was correct. Yeah. DJ Pudgy P. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica Wright, Jason Furman, Jordan Tilson, Mitchell Munsey, Joe Riley, Trevor Larson, and Kiana White. Nice. Okay. I have the following spoopy shout outs to Emma from Nat. Happy birthday. To Emma. Ezra Noka from Emberly Rin. Welcome to the world, little brother. I love you so much. To Jessica from Spencer. Love you so much. They are getting married on 8-13, which is Friday the Mm -hmm. 13th. And it's also our anniversary. Yep, Yep. awesome. So cute. And that's it. And that's all for today. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith on social media and badmagicmerch.com merch design, store at badmagicproductions.com for customer service, Joe Paisley and Zach Flannery uh, for producing, directing, Joe Paisley directing and producing today, Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, Sophie Evans for finding the first Japanese story, and thanks to Olivia Lee for finding the second Miami-based story. If you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes and more, check out our Patreon and enjoy your nightmares, creeps, and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye, guys. If spirits threaten me in this place, 
fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared to death. Mad Magic Productions.